Hi guys, I hope you're doing well. Today I want to talk about description as a mode of writing. And as you know from our early reading notes and all those things, the description is a rhetorical mode. And that is how we look at the world. So description in the rhetorical mode has to do with how do we describe the world around us? And it is the first mode that we always cover because everything else tends to stem from that. So as we move forward into like the, the description piece, got to do a couple clicks and get things shared. But I think you guys are going to like this. This is going to be something that ends up being really interesting. And it's going to lead us into our first major paper. So description, as we talk through it, we're going to talk about how it works and how we read it and how we write it. We're not going to get into the revision and editing too deeply at all today because we're going to get into that when we're doing the paper itself. That's when we're going to heavy hit it. But we will talk a little bit about um, the kind of a checklist to give it to you. And, and so as you read and as you write, it's the same checklist. It's going to be awesome. So we use description in everyday life. We describe you know, a, a meal that we had that was like the best meal ever, or maybe even a worst meal ever. Uh, we might describe an event that took place. Uh, I might look at my dad's 80th birthday event, and it was a surprise. And I could talk about the look on his face when everybody says surprise and started singing happy birthday. You know, you can kind of picture, you don't have to know exactly what my dad looks like to imagine an 80 year old guy coming in the room and having a surprise. Um, it worked really well, but I want to look at like description and, and really talk about it. I have a couple of examples here. The scent of a summer rain. When somebody thinks of a summer rain, especially in our area, sometimes and what I'm going to talk about like the big summer storms. I'm talking about like those gentle rains that come straight down. That was something when we first moved to Arkansas when I was 12, I wasn't used to, I didn't even know that could happen. In, in Western Nebraska, where I'm originally from, the rain kind of comes sideways because of the wind. But if you have a really nice, gentle summer rain, it can come straight down and, and you're smelling like fresh, washed kind of air. You might smell the scent of the earth. You, like there's, there's a different special smell to it. There's also a taste of a sour lemon that's also really important. And, and lemon is my favorite flavor. So I have to use that as an example. But you can imagine, like think of this, um, you know, you're sitting, you go out to eat and you just want to enjoy your coffee and conversation, but your kids are getting kind of squirmy. And even if you don't have kids, you're going to do this when you do. So they get kind of squirmy and, and all that. And when they're really little, it's not like you're going to give them your cell phone, right? So what do you do? You take out that slice of lemon, lemon out of your water and hand it to them. And the first thing they do is they look at it that goes in the mouth. And imagine that kind of puckered look. And, and if, if they're like my kids, they had the full body shake. And it was hilarious. Oh my gosh, you could picture any kid doing this. You could even look at YouTube videos for this. And it's really, it's like cheap entertainment for a parent, okay? But that taste of a sour lemon, we might describe it not just sour, but the, the citrus, the acid, the bitterness, those kind of things, the clench of your jaw when it really gets you. Those are ways to really kind of describe what we're really doing is using those senses to capture the ideas. We want our reader to somehow experience just a little bit of it to make a stronger connection. And that means we kind of look at like our thoughts, our feelings, the things that we're talking about through the senses. Now what, <clears throat> excuse me, what happens is that we don't just think of specific sense of a summer rain, we're thinking about the full experience maybe the humidity in the air, or walking around and feeling the, the, the warm drops hitting our skin, the sound of the kind of like that pitter patter of, of the drops hitting the ground and all of those things. So you, you hear, see, taste, touch and smell. 
And if we can cross over those ideas in our descriptions, then it becomes more visceral, more real for our reader and better able to connect to the, the content that we're talking about. So what we're doing here is trying to paint a verbal picture. And um, one of my kids said, you know, hey, just put paint on the wall. Well, that doesn't quite work, but think of this. If we wanna have a good description, let's create a dominant impression. Like what is the big idea you're trying to get across? I think this example would make a great Hallmark card. I want to write, I miss you on a piece of rock and throw it in your face just to make you realize how much missing you hurts. It would work, right? Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to be throwing rocks at anybody, but the idea, it is not just that I haven't seen you in a while. How's your mama doing? No, this is I missed you so much. It's painful. And that's what makes a Hallmark card work. And, and what happens is that dominant impression gets sent to the reader and it's really important. Like there's no missing it. You understand it right away. So you can use the description to send that impression, send that message to your reader. But you got to do it as kind of that visual. Don't just tell them about it. Show what actually happened. And description allows us to do that. Now, if I am a, say like a, um, maybe a sports announcer or something, and, and I'm trying to talk about a game, and I just say, the basketball game was filled with exciting, breathtaking moments. And that's it. Like, there's nothing about that game that sounds exciting, even though I told you it was exciting. Nobody wants to hear about that. What we want to hear is like, what really happened? So think of that, that descriptive kind of idea where you can give the experience. The basketball game was won in the last two seconds by Monica Lopez, a rangy port guard who hit a jumper from the top of the key over the outstretched arms of the player trying to stop her. And you don't even have to know anything about basketball to kind of picture, here's this girl, she's, she's dribbling down the court and she's coming up and there's somebody standing there and they're waving their arms and they're, you know, like this score is like neck and neck. And she hits a jumper, which means she jumped up and let the ball fly. And I'm thinking like slow-mo movie here and the ball's kind of arcing over slowly and it hits, but it doesn't just whoosh through because that's not the drama of it. Maybe it hits and rolls just a little bit. Maybe it almost comes out, but then it falls in and the crowd goes wild. That's what we're looking for here. You don't have to be so outrageous and throw your arms around and all that kind of stuff. But if you use the language of description effectively, then people will understand it. They're going to follow it. They're going to be engaged with it and they'll be, be better able to get your message. And after all, that's what we're trying for. Now, when we talk about description, I want to talk about this, this kind of spectrum. And we have objective and subjective. And we're going to talk about them kind of as like this pure form of it. Most of our language is kind of somewhere in between. But objective description has nothing to do with our thoughts, our opinions, our ideas. It, it's really not about us. This would be like reporting the facts. If you're a news reporter and here is what happened. I mean, like pure news, not like, like biased news stuff. Uh, we're not analyzing it. We're just giving the information. So it's more impartial. We're thinking kind of precise information, uh, like a, a marketing survey or a lab report. It could be a medical diagnosis. Um, you know, if a doctor tells you that you broke your leg, he's not going to come in and go, oh my goodness, you broke your leg. You know, nobody's going to do that. What it is going to be, this is what happened. This is what we're going to do to fix it. They'll have to describe it though for you to understand. So anytime that you need something that is very accurate, very unbiased information, and you're going to describe that, that is objective. So this would be, one more example might be grading papers. 
I never grade papers if I'm upset or if I have a headache or it's been a bad day or something like that, because you know those aren't going to turn out well. So I'm always going to grade when I can grade everything at once and I can use my rubric and I've got the time and space to, to do it and I can do it fairly. So I'm going to make sure that I balance it. That's what objectivity does. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum is subjective description. And this is personal impressions. This is what we think, what we're feeling, all of those things. So instead of that objective raw data, we're talking about how we're feeling ourselves. And what we're trying to do is create that emotional response, that sensory response for the reader. So one example might be like those poor puppy commercials, you know, the ones like, cause it's really cold right now. And they're showing with, with the really soft song. And we're talking about through the eyes of an angel and the puppy is, he's lost an eye and he's in the snow and he's freezing. And you just look at it and you think, I need a puppy and I'm going to give him all my money. Like that's, that's kind of the thing. It, it could even be hey, this is a really cool car. You want to come here and get the car while it's on sale. You know, all of those things where we kind of make those emotional ties, those emotional connections, that's going to be subjective. Now, usually in conversation and even sometimes our writing or our research, it's somewhere in the middle. Uh, when we look at bias and all of those things, then that's where we're starting to kind of go back and forth. But it's pretty cool when you think about it. Now, here is that checklist that I mentioned. So before we get into the writing part, let's look at how you can analyze the, a text, like our poem. You can analyze our poem for these description essentials and see how our author is using those, those pieces. Excuse me, my husband just called. So... The dominant impression has to do with the overarching idea that the, the reader's talking about, or, or excuse me, that the author is talking about. So what is the message? What is that that, that is coming across? What is the purpose of the, the author giving this message? And what kind of details are showing the action? What kind of details are showing the meaning of the message. So those details that show rather than tell. How does the author engage one's senses? And in our poem, we might be looking at a bird, we might be looking at a river. It, it just kind of depends on, on what text we're looking at and how that actually works. Um, but think about those five senses and, and be able to talk about those ideas. Something else is that consistent point of view. How is the author speaking? Is the author kind of being just a narrator? Is an author being like first person, like this is my experience? Or is there more to it than that? Then think about how the text is organized. Uh, does one idea lead into the next? And how does the author transition between those ideas? Because when you get something really good like that, it becomes really meaningful if you can see how those pieces fit. And in our works of poetry, each stanza has a specific purpose and it leads to the next poem, or excuse me, the next stanza, the next idea. And everything is gonna to come to that logical conclusion. What is that overarching lesson? What is that satisfying end to that text that you're gonna to get to? Now, when we look at the writing of that, this is a checklist for you as a writer. What are you trying to get across, that dominant impression? So every paragraph that you write, everything from your thesis statement to the topic sentences to the details and explanation, everything has to develop that dominant impression. So that dominant impression would be the thesis statement. It would be that conclusion that closes the loop on the idea. What kind of details are you using that allows your reader to visualize, to experience what it is that you're saying? And, and part of that might be, how do you reference the text and then explain it? Using those senses. 
So it might be how the bird reacts. What do you hear? It could be the sound of the river, the sound of the ideas. And both of the authors that I tend to use, I use Maya Angelou and I use Langston Hughes. And both of them in these poems that, that I use it for this paper, they really talk about metaphors and people. It's not about the birds or the rivers, it is about people. And that point of view comes through the way that they're talking about it. So how would you do the same thing? How would you discuss the ways that the author engages those senses, creates that point of view, all of that? But you have to do it through a point of view of your own. It's not about what I think or what I feel, it's what is. Most of the time, college level papers are written in third person. So he, she, it, they, them, those kind of things, the author, the, the poem, the poet. Uh, when we're looking at other kind of ideas, <coughs> excuse me, oh my goodness. Uh, so when we're looking at other ideas, when we're thinking about what I have to say, I'm not going to say in my opinion, or I think, or I feel, because let's face it, in academia, nobody cares what we think or what we feel. So just take that part out. That's all you got to do. And maybe in my rough draft, I might say, in my opinion, the bird is this. Then in the revision and editing part, I'm going to take in my opinion out and make the sentence a lot stronger for that. So that way the author and, and the reader, you know, like we're really kind of making sense of what's going on. And the reader doesn't say, well, I don't care about your opinion. But it doesn't help, right? So as we're writing the papers, that meaningful organization as one idea fills into the next. And how does those idea, how do those ideas really come through as you're discussing it? Are you developing each of the steps or each of the pieces of your analysis in that dominant impression? That meaningful organization is going to be key and we'll get through that. Everything that we're doing comes to a logical conclusion where you provide that ultimate lesson, that satisfying ending to your paper where the reader is like, man, that was really good. And then I want to go talk about it because it was so good. So these are the description essentials as a reader and a writer that are really going to make a difference to how you analyze a text and how you write about it. In description, we use a lot of figurative language, and I want to introduce two of them here that you've probably already thought about or even heard about. Uh, simile is a type of comparison, and as you may know, it uses like or as. Something is like something else, so it talks about a similarity, and it's a smaller comparison, so kind of these ideas that it shows the, how are they similar together? And what we do is look at the one that we know and the one that we don't know. And because they're similar, we can make some assumptions as a reader. Now, the example I have comes from my son when he was really little, he's about five. And when my son was little, just like all my kids, I've got three, uh, when they would play, they could come into a perfectly clean room and all the toys would just jump off the shelves for them. They didn't have to touch anything. It just happened. And then it looked like this crazy person had gone in and just played with everything. And I had sent him to clean his room. And I, you know, a few minutes later, I'm going to come in and check. And when I did, he says, I'm sorry, mother, but my room looks as if a tornado ripped through it. Right, Nathan? Sure it did. It's really bad because he even had like a little path, like a tornado that hit. Um, we had to have a little meeting about cleaning the room and not getting distracted, but it worked. And he says as if or like a tornado hit it. And that's simile. So not only did we get the room clean, but I got a really good example. Now, later on, he was about 10. And he created this really neat metaphor. A metaphor is a little bit of a bigger comparison. And it can be even a really long comparison. We could have an extended metaphor that 
that kind of takes a, a place over a time frame, like the whole poem, for example. Uh, so a metaphor is that bigger comparison that says something is something else, not just like it, it's not similar to it, but it is something else. And Nathan was about 10. And by that time, you know, like I would just go check every 30 minutes or so. And Nathan, what happened? Because nothing had been done. 10 year olds, they're kind of wonky weird. And he says, dear mother, please ignore the wasteland of my room. Well, you know that didn't work out, but I got a good metaphor. And what the room looked like, it wasn't like, you know, this barren kind of stretch. I always think like Mad Max movies, like the old Mad Max, not the new one, because that one's not as good. But where things are broken or they're just kind of, kind of disfigured or something has happened and it's just all over the place. And that was pretty much his room. <sighs> We had a little come to Jesus meeting about the room and I got a really great metaphor example. What you're gonna see for our poetry is that extended metaphor. Uh, Maya Angelou uses birds and Langston Hughes uses rivers and they're talking about something else. The birds for Angelo, they're not real birds. They're not, they're not just birds, I'll say that. They're actually people. And Langston Hughes, the rivers aren't just about bodies of water, they're actually civilization, people. So that something is representing something else and we make those really strong connections and that's what this type of figurative language can do. Now, as we read and write, I've got a couple examples for you. Make sure that you use the, that checklist I gave you because it really does work well. And kind of think about how the audience needs to visualize. Are you creating that mental picture, that mental experience that you're trying to get across? Because, you know, sometimes what's what's on the page isn't really what came out of our head is, or what we think is is there. What we got to do is kind of be that reader too and, and take a step back and look at it. That this, uh, the description of essentials is going to help you do that. So I got a couple pictures here that kind of help. Uh, there's the Great Wall of China. And aside from being great, what makes it great? If we were going to explain this, we might talk about the immense size of the Great Wall. It is not just very tall and strong and, and wide. It is also extremely long, goes for thousands of miles. It's so big, so great that you can see it from space. I mean, how cool is that? Now we might talk about the history of it and, and why it was made and how it was made even. And, and even the, because it's one of the, the great wonders of the world, we might look at the construction of it and, and you know, I don't know, did you know that uh, much of the Great Wall was built by slaves? They don't even have a clue how many tens of thousands of people actually helped build it. And some of them were worked so long, so hard that they passed away from that hard labor. So instead of burying them beside it, they put them inside the wall. They became part of their work. And, and even though that's kind of gory and, and kind of creepy in a way, it's also kind of cool. So, you know, we could talk about these kind of ideas. You might look at the, the different uh, kind of stations, those big sections, the, the different areas. And if you watch Mulan, you know what I'm talking about, where it was the quickest way to communicate an emergency across China because of those fires would be lit all the way across. Somebody would know something is happening that's important. You know, this is something that's pretty neat when you think about it. And as you describe something like this, using those senses and, and all of that, then you can get across to the reader. Here's something that's kind of fun too. What did one red panda say to the other red panda? And I've had students say, oh, they're playing the mirror game. They're trying to mirror each other's images like little kids do. Maybe students are saying, don't shoot, stop. 
maybe they're going to fight each other. Or, you know, I've had so many people, but it's not just the action that is taking place with their little paws up in the air. These red pandas, you might look at the environment itself. They're in the snow and, you know, they're not baring their teeth or anything. They don't look angry. So maybe they're just having fun. Maybe they're going to do like a double high five or something like that. You can really tell a story and use description to make the connections for your reader. And that's what I really want you to think about. This is really an important way to write and a way to explain the world around you. When we do that, then we do it effectively, then we can really make a difference to a reader. And isn't that what we're looking for? So kind of think about those ideas. And if you ever have any questions about description, or as, especially as we get into writing the paper, then please contact me. I am here for you. I want you to be successful and I'm here to help. So usually the easiest way to get hold of me is text message because you know I've always got my precious with me. Um, but we also have email and you know phone call. I can Zoom, we can do all that. Um, and it doesn't have to be during office hours. Even though my office hours are two to four, it doesn't mean that we can only talk about you know during that time. So feel free to contact me at any time. I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you so much for spending your time with me.